Welcome to Key Conversations, where you get to connect with the best of the music business, unlocking the secrets to exploding your music career, presented by In the Key of Success. I'm your host, Cheryl B. Inglehart. The conversations you're about to hear are between our special guest and participants of my MX4 course, the Marketing and Branding, Money Making, Mentorship Mastermind for Musicians. They are singers, songwriters, composers, producers, and artists just like you asking their burning questions of our experts while transforming their careers over six weeks. If you think this could be you, check out mx4course.com to schedule a free half-hour coaching call with me to see if we'd be a good fit. So let's get started. Uh, Chrysanthi, do you have do you have a question right off the top of your head for John? Uh, this is something I've been trying to know on this project that I've been working on. It's like it involves me taking photos, taking Polaroid photos, and on the back I write like two bars of music, like by hand, like on stuff, um, you know, write it out. Um, it's just like the tiniest snippet, like two to four bars. Are, is that too short for me to like? Have any rights over? Well, it depends that. on how original the work is. If it's an original creative work, yes. Then yes, then it's eligible for copyright protection. Uh, the Copyright Act doesn't really specifically define what a musical work is, so you can feel free to to do that. Uh, uh, so if, if that is considered a work, if you consider that to be a work, uh, and I know it's very short, but um, it, it's, it, it is possible to, uh, to um, protect that by copyright. Okay. Okay. <laughs> right. And, and, and the thing about copyright, while we're there, let me mention this, and you've probably gone through this, Cheryl, and it's possible, or you will, uh, during your course. It is possible to, to register multiple works on one registration. You know, the ECO form, uh, copyright uh, form, you can protect both the sound recording and the composition copyright by checking the PA for the composition and the SR uh, boxes on that form. But it depends on what the work is. The work could be uh, Casey's songs for 2015. And Casey's songs, for, that's the title of the work, but it could consist of a number of different songs. Uh, and so I say that because it's $35 if you file online. So I just want to let you know that there, there can be problems with that, however. It's very important for you to keep very detailed records as to what songs you file on which registration form, because if anybody ever infringes on your copyright you, and you decide to sue them in federal court, one of the things that you have to have, you have to produce the copyright registration. And if for some reason you forget which song was on which registration, uh, it can create some complications. So you just have to keep very detailed records on that. Cool. Yeah, that's great. I do always encourage people to register all their songs under one record instead of as yeah. as they write them, especially if you have the digital stamp, you know, when you recorded it, you've got that, you've got the, when you uh, registered it with your PRO, ASCAP or CSAC or BMI, not that any of those are official copyrights, but there are ways right. to, to track when that piece of work existed and it's, you can't alter a digital timestamp generally. <laughs> right, right, um, right. But it is always good to have the copyright ultimately. So, right. yeah. Okay. Great, great question. That was good. That was good to open that up into that land. Um, Casey, let's come back to you. I just had another general question, but I honestly don't know much about music entertainment law and anything like that. So I was just kind of just wondering, what are all of the services that you guys can provide for musicians and entertainers? Hmm. Great question. Well, there's two types of entertainment lawyers. Uh, one is a litigation attorney, which are lawyers that go to court. I call them suit and tie attorneys. I used to wear one. Uh, I, I used to litigate, but uh, then I transitioned into, and, and so they're, they're court lawyers. They're lawyers that file lawsuits and try lawsuits, litigation attorneys. The other type of entertainment lawyer is called a transactions attorney, and that's what I am. I handle the negotiation of contracts, but I also uh, um, handle putting together entities, uh, filing trademarks, helping and assisting in filing copyrights. Uh, many times entertainment lawyers will also be involved in possibly shopping a deal for you. 
and using their contacts to try to arrange for uh, agreements with uh, record companies and publishing companies and even management companies. And so we get involved in all of those aspects in addition to just counseling and advising clients on some of the uh, not simple things, but some of the basic things they need to do, which is becoming very important now as we change to this digital uh, 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 age, uh, because artists now have so much opportunity through the internet to get exposure and to make things happen on their own that they need to recognize once again that once you put together a product, you make an investment, you create an asset, a copyright, a sound recording, or a song, you're in business. <laughs> so it is very important for you to structure your business in the way to be able to protect your assets in the business. That's really the American way, is to really build a business with assets and then at some point cash out. I was just reading an article in the Wall Street Journal yesterday about Yahoo!, uh, and Yahoo is getting ready, thinking about selling part of their business. And so it's gotten to the point that they're going to sell assets. They're going to sell uh, a, a portion of their business uh, to keep uh, moving uh, with their investment in Alibaba, which is a huge uh, Chinese firm. And so really, it, I, we're talking about that on a mega scale. But if you're talking about a songwriter and you're, or an artist, you are creating assets. And you never know when these assets are going to be used in the future. So it's important for you to protect them as best you can. Awesome. Yeah. Um, let's go back to Alex. Sure. So um, I, I get mixed um, answers on this. So I'm, I'm going to, I would love to hear your take that I've been operating for the last couple of years as a sole proprietorship. Okay. I have not. And formed my own what, what is your business? What's your business? My business is my artist, Alex Winters. Okay. And so I'm wondering at what point, at what point should I consider incorporating or becoming an LLC or forming that record label and publishing company? Well, let me ask you a couple of questions before uh, I give you an answer. Uh, how well developed is your career? Are you just beginning? Are you starting to do gigs? Or do you have certain songs placed? Are you performing live? Yes. I'll, I'll okay. Do that. Oh, you do? Okay. Do you perform regularly in nightclubs and other places? Yes. Okay. And are your recordings for sale, either physically or digitally? Yes. Okay. Wow. Okay. You're in business. <laughs> it's time for you to possibly, you know, it depends on the kind of uh, uh, the types of engagements that you're doing. If you're starting to uh, reach the larger clubs of over maybe three or 400 people, uh, sometimes it's best to uh, have a, a, what they call a loan out company for your services, uh, which will protect you from personal liability which is another area that I cover in my book, uh, the types of entities and the types of liabilities it protects you from. Because you never know when something's going to happen in a club. So if you're working in a club atmosphere, I remember when I was working in the clubs with my home band and fights broke out, you know, in the audience. And you never know. Uh, if, if you are the draw for that night, and someone gets injured in the club, they could bring you in as a party that that's the reason why they were there and maybe you were negligent in not providing the right type of security, which means you could be subject to a lawsuit. Now, when you have personal liability, that means that if a judgment is entered against you uh, and makes you liable for uh, negligence, uh, they can collect that judgment and get the money from your personal assets. They could freeze your bank account. Uh, they can uh, possibly seize your car if you own one and sell it. They can foreclose on your home depending on the amount of the judgment. So it, it can become, as you start working uh, in, in bigger and bigger nightclubs, important possibly for a new artist to uh, want to protect themselves from liability and go from a sole proprietorship maybe to an LLC which is much easier to up uh, to maintain than a corporation. Hmm. 
I also, just to tack on to that, I, I became an LLC in 2011. Um, I was doing a lot of work as a composer um, and knew that if I wanted to claim the ownership of certain songs or someone there, there was, you know, any possible future legal thing around copyright of something that I had written that, you know, in our small agreement invoice, whatever, the one page that says I retain those copyrights. And if there was an argument for that same, same reason, they could hold me liable. And instead of having my personal assets on the line, it was whatever was in my business. And right. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Excellent point, Cheryl. If you're a songwriter, are you a songwriter, Alex? She is. She is? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, if you're a songwriter, yes, you do want to protect those very important assets, your copyrights, because that is a property, that's an intellectual property that could be used to satisfy judgments unless you protect them through a, an entity like an LLC. That's great. Um, I, I get the question a lot. Are there any tax benefits of being an LLC? And I have been advised in the past that as long as you're operating as a business, you have a separate bank account, you have a separate credit card, you have um, you can show for those three years that you are uh, a, a, a music business entity, even though you don't have a an LLC or an S corp or a corporation. Yes, tax absolutely. So so proprietorship is excellent because you can write off any business expenses that you have against your personal income tax uh, uh, liability, which can reduce the taxes that you have to pay and could result in you even uh, having a refund at time. The same thing is true for a partnership. And the interesting thing about it is that that's one of the reasons why uh, when people opt for uh, a different type of entity like an LLC or corporation, many times they'll go with the LLC because it, it gives you the opportunity to have the same tax benefits that you have. In other words, being able to write off your expenses related to your business on your personal income tax return. In other words, you file a separate schedule for your business and if it shows a loss, then that's gonna reduce your tax liability on your personal side. So there could be definite tax benefits for you doing business as uh, a, an a part, a sole proprietorship partnership or an LLC that are different from you being a just a regular corporation. Uh, there are certain types of corporate entities uh, and, and the possibilities to have those benefits as well. Subchapter S filing with the IRS can give you the same type of benefit. But most people and many other entertainers today are using the LLC form of entity. Even the number of major movie companies, if you go to a movie and wait till the final end page of the credits, you're going to see who owns the copyright in that movie. And many times it's going to be an LLC. Sometimes people put together LLCs for the sole purpose of producing a movie. Yeah, that's really great. Um, so we're almost out of time. I wanted to see if I could just do a quick laser of a couple of questions that I hear all the time and see what your answers are. If you have two more minutes. Sure. Okay, great. The first one that I get a lot, if you are co-writing a song, does a simple, we own, I own 50%, so-and-so owns 50% of the song until you register on an ASCAP, does that suffice as a written agreement? Uh, yes, this is the lightning round. Quick answer <laughs> is yes. <laughs> Quick answer and is I, yes. I, I, recommend, I recommend people go to Google uh, songwriter split sheets, and they will give you forms, and, and you can pull up forms that basically just indicate who uh, who the songwriters are, what their percentage interest is uh, as far in the copyright. And of course, it's dated and it's signed. And uh, it's important to put all of the information as far as the name and, and the address wouldn't help, uh, wouldn't hurt. Uh, and the percentage interest that you own in that copyright, because even when you file a copyright registration, that information is not included. They don't ask the percentages. So it's important for you to have a separate document. All right, sorry. No, that, no, Go sorry. That, that's great. And a follow up on that then, how is the, the what you're registering on your PRO, ASCAP, BMI, or, or CSAC, uh, the publishing and the writer's share, how is that different from the master share, different from the copyright? Oh, wait a minute. You lost me on that. Say that again. So the, you can have a writer, you can co-write a song, but then if you put that song on your record and you're paying for it, you could still own the copyright and still own the master. And the only time there's any a split is on the back end royalties. You, yeah, that, yeah. That's possible. Well, 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 you have a good point. If it's registered with ASCAP and BMI and with the songwriters, are going to have a percentage of the songwriter's share. Uh, but it's important for you to also put down the percentage 
uh, to have a document showing who owns the copyright and to what percentages you have. But no, I see what you're saying. ASCAP, CSAC, and BMI, following the registrations there is also evidence of, of your percentage ownership. And, and this is one of the things that's kind of plaguing the industry now, is that people, uh, a lot of these, even the, the publishing companies and record companies, particularly with ownerships of the copyright, and who uh, and who's writing as far as who they have to pay the mechanical royalties to, um, the songwriters, is sometimes information that may be incomplete, and record companies will not pay royalties if they don't have the correct information as to who the songwriters are and how to contact them. That's one I'm suggesting. If you have an additional uh, um, uh, a songwriter split sheet, you can have that kind of information, or either a songwriter's agreement between all of the songwriters that can show uh, uh, that that can be used as evidence of to who owns what percentage of the song. Awesome. Really great. The last question that I get a lot is if you are in a band and you are the writer for the band, what sort of agreement needs to be in place? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this one. <laughs> What's, very important. Very, yeah. very important. This is the reason why you need to have a band agreement, which will have uh, break out the, the, the percentage uh, uh from various revenue sources, and that's such an important uh, thing. I had uh, I had the opportunity to teach the fray when I was at University of Colorado at Denver. Isaac Slade, Joe King, and uh, uh, Ben Wasaki, who was in my introduction to music business class, and they were going through the negotiation of the contract when they did it. And I I didn't represent them. Another attorney I know represented them. And of course, as you know, if you don't know, the fray became very successful in the middle part of the last decade. And they had great songs. Now, Isaac Slade and Joe King wrote most of the songs. So in that band agreement, you need to, to say, and sometimes the band agreement will say, if if everyone in, in the in the group agrees, maybe they, they will split the ownership of the copyright and the songs equally. There's four guys in the band, they would have split the songs four ways if that was the case. I don't think that was the case with the fray. So Joe and Isaac were the songwriters on the first two albums. And uh, that changed, however, I'm sure, I, I don't know, I've spoken with them, I've never asked them this question. But about the third album, I noticed that the songs were written by all four of the guys. And I'm sure what happened was that <laughs> the other two guys saw Isaac and Joe becoming rich from writing these songs. And they were like, wait a minute. Uh, and, and I know Joe and Isaac usually write the melody and the lyrics, and the other guys uh, add with the drums and with the guitars. And, and they possibly said, we want to start writing together. So sometimes that has to be incorporated in the band agreement as to how the songs will be split. It can go a number of ways. They can say we're going to split each song according to each person's contribution in it, which Isaac and Joe were the main contributors the first time. Or they could say uh, all songs written uh, for the band will be split among all of the band members equally. So, And it could be any variation thereof. So it's important to have a band agreement because that is the intellectual property and the copyright and the composition is completely separate from uh, the royalties that you're going to earn as an artist. You might very well, as an artist, the Frey possibly split their artist royalties four ways. But the songwriter royalties for the copyright and the composition went to the people who made the contribution initially. And then after a couple of years, they changed it so that they would get equal shares of both pots of money. Yeah, it's you can wrap your you can go on and on and we can talk about this for ages. It's it's hard to wrap your head around when there's so many different levels, the front end, the back end, the royalties, the splits, the ownership, the publishers. There, there's a lot here. And uh, where can we find your book? Where's the easiest way to find more information about you and all the all the things that you're up to and your book? Oh, great. My website is KelloggLaw.com. Kellogg Law. You can also follow me on Twitter at Kellogg Law. Kellogg and is K-E-L-L-O-G-G, -G, you guys. So just like the cereal. Awesome. K E L L O G G uh, Law L A W dot com. Perfect. And uh, the best place to get my book is at Amazon.com. Perfect. Can go to Amazon.com and the name of the book 
is Take Care of Your Music Business, uh, second edition, the legal and business aspects you need to know to 3.0. Um, everyone that's in MX4, thank you for your awesome questions. This has been a great conversation. John, I can't thank you enough for your time and your wisdom and your experience bringing that to this platform. Well, everybody, thank you for listening to season one of Key Conversations. We are going to pick it up soon, I promise, with new episodes, new stuff to talk about to further your career. I really appreciate you listening. If you haven't yet rated, please do so and share this podcast with your friends who are musicians or striving to be a musician. I am really excited to hear about your career. So please leave comments, shoot me emails, and definitely check out in the key of success.com for other resources that can help support you in your career. Please don't forget to rate and comment on iTunes and Stitcher Radio if you like this podcast. It's the best way to keep it going, get more subscribers, and continue to share this awesome information with the indie music community. Thank you, and we'll see you next time. All of the music on this podcast has been created by yours truly. The theme song is called Inevitably, written with Cameron Ernst and produced by Joey Ock. You can find all the songs, plus more information on my music career at CherylBE.com. If you want to be one of the reasons I can keep this podcast and my blog Living on Gigging going, then head to Patreon.com slash CBE Music. There, you can contribute a dollar, two dollars, five dollars for the creation of each of these free musician resources. Together, we can keep them coming and inspire other creative people to do what they love and do it well. Again, that's patreon.com slash CBE music. Key Conversations is sponsored in part by Bandzoogle. They make it easy to build a beautiful website for your music. Their step-by-step system gets you online in minutes, and you can choose from hundreds of mobile-friendly themes and customize them with their easy point-and-click editor. All the features you could possibly imagine for a professional website are built in. So because you are a Key Conversations podcast listener, you get a special three-month free trial just for you. Go to www.inthekeyofsuccess.com slash resources and click on the Banzoogle logo to access your free extended trial.